so hopefully you can hear me. Um, I'll keep the introductions brief. Um, unfortunately, uh, the academic director of Vail, uh, Debbie Snell, can't be here today, so she sends her apologies and uh, passes on her best to everybody. Uh, so in her place, I'll just uh, would like to introduce our speakers for today. Um, we're going to start with uh, Dr. Swati Gupta and Joan Amelie, who in December I could call doctor, but I'm not allowed to at the moment. But uh, as soon as you graduate, you can. Um, they're going to talk about the Revive project, and it's a, a, a project that looks at virtual rehabilitation, or virtual reality and rehabilitation, and uh, uh, wheelchair users. So um, without any further ado, I'll hand it over to Hello everyone. Um, this presentation is about the Revive Project, uh, which stands for Rehabilitation via uh, Immersive Virtual Environment. Uh, so what we did was uh, we created a personalized virtual reality rehab system for um, helping with the uh, spinal cord injury. So helping adjust back to the real world life uh, in the virtual uh, world first before you uh, people are transferred to the wheelchair and start using that. So to get a little bit of experience doing that, um, and it uh, we hope. We have done some uh, studies which you will talk about, uh, but we hope that it will facilitate a better reintegration back into the society. And uh, the thing with uh, virtual reality is that it's a very safe and supported setting, so there's no danger of falling over or tripping over something or you know or getting injured. So you are in the virtual reality. You're learning how um, to move around in the wheelchair while being comfortably seated on the chair. Um, a little bit about virtual reality and Oculus Rift for those of you who are not familiar. Um, virtual reality uh, creates an illusion of another world right in front of your eyes. So you uh, look at that headset, it's called Oculus Rift, it has been bought by Facebook now. So you put it on, so typically when you see a computer screen, you see the screen but you don't see what's behind it because there's screens in front of you, but you can see around it. So, but when you put on the Oculus uh, Rift headset, you see the screen all around yourself. You can just turn it around and look everywhere, and you can be here, but you have the illusion of being in a jungle or, or you know, in a supermarket or anywhere. So, um, and you can uh, simulate sight, sound, touch, and you can reach out. You can there are some smart gloves through which you can reach out and manipulate objects in the virtual world. So you can flip things over or open a drawer or close it or And um, usually the typical of applications for VR are um, exploring dangerous situations. So they're used in the military a lot, for instance. And uh, to promote different teaching and learning methods, so it can be customized. And movies, people are making movies with, in virtual reality. I've never seen one, but I'm very excited at the prospects of seeing one someday. Um, video games, therapy. Um, some of the challenges, because VR is still very, it's not new, it has been going on for a long time, but the progress has been slow, and it's new in the sense that it's more accessible now with the Oculus Rift kind of headsets. So that's why there's suddenly a lot of uptake of uh, in developers of trying to build something in virtual reality. So from that perspective, it's, it, we can say that it's new. Mm -hmm. uh, and a less explored design space, so there's a lot of challenges. How to create immersion? So typically, if, when you look at a screen and you're creating a 3D game or something, it's a very well-known and well-understood paradigm, how to create a 3D game, for instance, within, uh, on, on your 2D screen. Uh, but creating emotion in virtual reality is completely different because you can look at the world from any perspective. So if I have my headset on and I'm in a jungle, I can walk there, turn around, and look at the same screen from a different perspective. So, and I, I can I can bend and I can look closely at an object, pick something up, and, you know. So the kind of emotion, the way you build emotion in VR is very different. Uh, 
Similarly, to create the sense of realism, how to design interaction with objects. So if you were going to pick up a coin in virtual reality, then it should uh, behave exactly the same way as it does in the real world. So if you drop it, it should flip over and it should make a sound. If it doesn't, then suddenly you're thrown out of the virtual world and you, you think. <laughs> um, setting the controller uh, is challenging because if you're moving in the virtual reality, then the way the controller is designed uh, is important because if it's not designed well, then again, you're thrown out of the immersion and you spook. Um, it requires a lot of computing power. We are getting there, but it still requires specialized computers. Bad design results in nausea, which Joe is going to talk at length about. <laughs> um, in therapy, so a lot of people are exploring the use of virtual reality in therapy to treat anxiety disorders, phobias, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, addiction, depression, pain. Um, the main um, reason why VR works in this kind of space is, uh, I think, two main reasons. One is distraction. So pain, uh, people have explored using this with patients who have uh, a lot of burns, her degree burns. And when, so the, the process of uh, um, uh, removing the bandage and, and cleaning the wounds is very painful. So changing, I mean, distraction has been used for a long time. You know, injection, you, you, know, you want to you know, do an injection on a child and then you, you know, distract them with a toy or whatever. But in case of virtual reality, what happens is it's sort of, um, you put on a headset, people, what, what they did was they created a virtual environment with uh, uh, a frozen um, uh, landscape. So uh, you, you, believe, you put on the headset and you feel like you were in a very cold environment and while they're changing the beard dressing. So it completely absorbs all your senses towards the positive environment, and then you have very limited senses left for the negative experience you're having in the real world. So distraction, and the other thing is, um, uh, what's the other thing? Yeah, the level of immersion. Uh, so you distract people, and then the, the uh, no, recreating, um, stressful situations again. So for instance, in PTSD or anxiety disorders, if somebody has uh, an anxiety or uh, has a phobia for spiders, so you put the headset on and you see spiders crawling all over you. So you keep recreating the experience again and again and you desensitize the people. So distraction and recreating uh, um, painful experiences. Same with PTSD, some people have, uh, when they have experienced uh, PTSD because of some terrorist attack or something, so they put on the headset and they see the same situation again and again. People, people have tried doing that for 9-11, uh, um, September 9-11 attacks, so you were in the environment and you see people flying off the buildings. You see them over and over again and there was significant level of reduction in symptoms. So that's how people have been trying to use VR in therapy for a long time. So why revive? We thought, well, uh, if we use revive uh, to train people with spinal cord injury to learn how to navigate in the virtual environment on their wheelchairs first, before being transferred to a, a physical wheelchair, it would result in more engagement in the therapy. Uh, it's fun. Um, and it would result in better cognitive maps of the environment because you, uh, you have to completely rethink and uh, how you move because right now, if I want to look back, I can do that. But if I'm on a wheelchair, it's a very different kind of movement. I'm probably going to have to move my wheelchair around. So you have to re relearn how to uh, navigate your environment. So if you do that uh, in a virtual environment, you separate the tasks of uh, you, the cognitive understanding of your environment and how to move and the physical act of navigation. So when we re uh, re um, uh, uh, separate those two, it results in better cognitive maps and improves performance on physical activities uh, and <coughs> activities of daily living. And all this we hope would uh, result in an improved discharge and reduced uh, readmission rates, help psychological adjustment to life because 
Again, using desensitization, you can, uh, so a lot of people report uh, uh, social anxiety when they go into a public space for the initial you know, few times when they're on the wheelchair. So if you, let's say if you, there's a virtual environment of the supermarket and you keep going there again and again and there's people walking around, so it helps you uh, get rid of that uh, anxiety um, in a very safe environment. Uh, and yeah, it can also uh, possibly aid cognitive recovery for any co-occurring traumatic brain injury. So the few words on development, um, we created a 3D model of the transitions environment here at Rover. Um, and then based on that 3D scan, we created a 3D model and incorporated the wheelchair navigation in there and then put it in the Oculus Rift environment. So there's a lot of people who did who were part of this project. Um, Stickman Media did the actual modeling, and we, uh, we uh, along with Joe and Debbie, came up with the idea of the whole thing. And Indigo is a company that did the 3D scanning of the environment. Dynamic Controls uh, provided the controller that we modeled in the environment, and Indigo Care provided the demo feature uh, to model the movement. It is now being, so as a result of this project is the new company that was launched called Entry Games. Uh, they're commercializing it and they were finalists recently in the New Zealand Innovators Award and they're participants of the Lightning Lab and today this afternoon they're giving a demo of where they're at now. Looking forward to that. And uh, so let's see if you recognize this. Said, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the testing that we're doing on this project. Um, so we're looking at doing three phases of uh, testing. I'm going to talk to you about phase one, which is what we've done so far, which is developing and modeling um, the system. Phase two is hoping to start next year as a pilot project, which will hopefully lead to a bigger um, scale project to test the system. So, at Bale, we are keen believers that people should be involved in systems that are going to affect them from early on, an integrated knowledge transfer approach. Um, so we wanted clinicians and experienced wheelchair users to be involved in the process as early as possible to give us feedback so we didn't finish the project and find out that everyone thought it was stupid. Um, so we got ethics approval from the University of Otago and we got people to test the equipment in groups of two to four, try the environment, um, and then provide fo uh, feedback for us in focus groups. Unfortunately, not everyone could make the fo focus groups, so we handed them and tracked them down and interviewed them instead. Um, and we used a, a general inductive approach to code the interviews, at the focus groups and interviews. So we had seven clinicians who took part in the study. There were two occupational therapists, four physios, and a nurse, um, with a range of experience from six to 32 years, and experienced wheelchair users, um, there were five wheelchair user participants, and they had a mean of 22 years experience of spinal cord injury. So basically we got four themes that emerged from the data. One was around the realistic system, one was the wheelchair training system. One was about overcoming resistance to technology, especially in our hospital system. Some people find new technology turnover quite difficult to keep up to date and they don't want to change what they were doing already. And working outside the rehabilitation bubble. The rehabilitation bubble was described as that nice environment that we have here at Burwood Hospital where everything is flat and accessible and the corridors are wide and the spaces in the rooms are reasonable. So people are used to living in this nice environment. 
So I'm going to talk about our results in terms of the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the good point that came across in the focus group was that first of all, that it was a realistic environment. And people talked about the realism in, in terms of the feeling of driving in the wheelchair, but also the um, familiarity of the transitions unit for the people who knew what it was like before they put the, the mask on. And so one of the health professionals said, even the sound of the chair and the controller contribute to the, the reality of it. Um, and the participants also saw lots of potential applications for the system, not just drive, learning how to drive a wheelchair, but as Swati said, the ability to model your home or um, a community environment before discharge to reduce any anxiety and to assist that familiarity before you get there. So there were some bad points. Um, people felt that the, the system had no measurements within it and the health professionals seemed to think that the patients could be a little bit competitive and so having a scoring system where they could um, beat themselves or beat other people or compete with each other within the system would make it um, better. Uh, and also to have some way of measuring as a clinician so that you know how people have improved and what changes that there have been. And also we do need to increase the realism. So one of the problems that we have is that you can change the virtual reality but you are not actually moving around <coughs> in a wheelchair. So some of the things like bumps and jolts are very difficult to simulate because you can't actually feel them in the virtual reality and some of the sensitivity about the controller, especially the acceleration and deceleration, that movement that you feel when you take off in a power chair was very difficult to simulate in the system and these are things that we need to work on. There are also some issues with the wheelchair controller. So first of all, finding a system to set the wheelchair controller up so it was in the correct position for where you would normally want to, to have it, right, left, forward, back, depending on your level of injury. Um, and also the fact that when you've got the, the headset on, you can't look down at your hand. And some people were trying to look at their hand to, to see where it was in relation to the controller, especially for turning and, and maneuvering. And again, that's very difficult to simulate in the virtual, rea virtual world. Um, and so Swati touched on ugly, um, and that was the nausea. Now, we were anticipating that we might have some issues with this because it's well documented in the literature that this can happen. But unfortunately, all of our participants to some degree have experienced nausea. Now, for some, it was just while they were in the virtual reality and they took the headset set off and they were fine. For others, this was quite prolonged and um, one person actually went home and physically was sick. So this is obviously a really big, <laughs> issue um, and especially if you're wanting to use this in the early stages of a rehabilitation setting we don't really want to be increasing nausea on the ward um, we might get some sponsorship by some anti-emetic drug companies <laughs> but that wasn't really where we were going with this um, and unfortunately because of the nausea there's a limited tolerance to the machine so obviously if you're feeling sick you don't really want to stay in the virtual world but long enough to get the cognitive mapping and to explore your environment. So from here, obviously we need to keep <laughs> continue testing um, and we need to try and make the system so that it's fun, so that it's measurable and most importantly that it's um, simple to use and one of the health professionals said it would have to be as, usually, as user friendly as possible and made that a lemon lightning can actually turn it off. Um, and obviously, uh, not for this nausea. Uh, so as I said, we're going to start um, phase two studies in 2016. In the meantime, um, MTech have been doing a great job in resolving the issues around the nausea and we are continuing to test that. We also want to look at modelling other um, more generic but still familiar environments such as shopping malls, cinema, um, that sort of thing. To, to see how that works um, and look at other applications and there are many other ways that we see that we can use the virtual environment and hopefully you know think ahead you know 
Back to the Future had their amazing hoverboard, which is almost a reality now. So we're hoping that in time, the technology will be able to catch up with the ideas that we've got for the research. Thank you.